This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Well, here in section nine, we deal with the last technical issue contained within the IHT chapter. It's not the last section, that's section 10, but that deals with IHT planning. As you have seen, and as we have said, of course, we know that when a taxpayer dies, they will be chargeable to IHT, not just the content of their chargeable estate, but also the transfers that have occurred within the seven years before the date of death. We also know that we have a nil rate ban to cover both those lifetime transfers and indeed the chargeable estate at death, and that is £325,000. Though, of course, it is possible that that could be boosted to a maximum 650000 by the transfer of an unused nil rate band from a spouse that sadly predeceased this particular individual. So it could be as high as 650000 But over that, we're talking about a 40% tax charge. Now, that is a huge tax charge. It's a huge amount, potentially, of the overall value of an individual's estate that is now going to go to HMRC rather than their kids, their grandchildren, the next generation or generations. So it's clearly something that needs to be planned for. You would seek to avoid any tax within, of course, the rules that you are allowed to apply, taking advantage of exemptions, reliefs, allowances, etc. But you would seek to avoid tax if you could. And what Section 10 deals with is the way that we might mitigate our exposure not just to IHT, but also that runs, runs hand in hand with it in this style of question, CGT, the other capital tax. What you know for IHT purposes is if you don't give anything away in lifetime and you die with, well, what might be nice here is five million pounds worth of chargeable estate, then over your 325 or whatever the nil rate band may be at that point for you, you're taxed at 40%. That is a huge charge that would go out of the value of the estate, leaving less to go to the next generation or beyond. So we have the point about succession planning. And as you'll see in the final lecture on section 10, that is comes down to one very easy basic concept is that if you give it away in lifetime and live for seven years, there will be no chargeability to IHT when you die. So lifetime gifting would be a way of avoiding the eventual exposure to IHT upon your death. Even if you didn't survive for the requisite seven years, if you live for three years, then at least some mitigation of the tax charge will apply through the application of taper relief. But that is not for this lecture, that is for our final lecture on section 10 and also with reference into uh, the final chapter within the study notes, chapter 26, that looks at not just capital taxes, but other areas as well of IHT planning. But what we've got here in this penultimate lecture is, as I've said, the final technical issue that we need to deal with within our syllabus. And, well, we haven't exactly saved the best until last, shall we say. Unless, of course, you like a challenge. What we have here is something that not always, but for many students over the years, has tended to cause problems, getting their heads around this particular issue. So I need you to focus and concentrate on this particular issue here and the examples that we'll go on to deal with, to try to, as it were, crack it first time to avoid those problems arising for you at the beginning and extending into the future. Okay, let's see what this is all about. Now it's entitled, simply enough, something we are familiar with, the seven year accumulation period. And as the note says here, in illustrations so far, apart from illustration eight, all the lifetime transfers, now we know other than exempt transfers, that's either PETs or CLTs, They've all taken place within the seven years prior to death and have all therefore been chargeable to IHT on the death of the taxpayer. We know also that the earliest, or if you want to call it the oldest transfer within that period, that seven year period, they're the first to use the nil rate band 
with the later transfers and all the chargeable estate at death, then once you've gone above the available nil rate band, as we've just been talking about, that's been taxed at 40%. So we've seen how to deal with pets, both individually and uh, then combined with CLTs. We know how to approach an examination question in terms of a full exercise there. We know that in relation to lifetime transfers, we must firstly do a working, that if the figures are not already given to us, that is, we must work from a transfer of value figure, in itself a figure that you may have to compute in an exam question, for example, the disposal of some, but not all of your shares in an unquoted company there. We compute the transfer of value, if needed. We then deduct the various lifetime exemptions and, of course, potentially exemptions that would also apply in death, i.e. transfers to spouse or civil partner. And we get a chargeable transfer. So job number one was to compute the chargeable transfer. And that holds true for both PETs and CLTs. Again, back earlier in this chapter, we saw how chronologically we would go through those lifetime transfers, working, as we've just said, down from the transfer of value, less any exemptions that are applicable to those transfers, whether they be pets, whether they be CLTs, and working through on a strict chronological basis. That could be firstly pet, CLT, pet, pet, CLT, CLT, whatever it might be there, whatever combination chronologically we go through them we get the chargeable transfer. As is likely then, one or more of those transfers will be CLTs. And if so, then that necessitates the first of the IHT computations to be prepared. That is, headed up, lifetime transfers chargeable when made. Now, if we've only got one of them, as we saw originally, then at the date the transfer was made, it was then chargeable. So we would have used at that point the nil rate band that existed at that date. And as we've said, ever since 0910, we've had the current and still 325,000 pound nil rate band. But if you went back before that, you would find lower numbers. Now, any nil rate band prior to the current 1920 tax year, you would be provided with within the question. You would be told what that figure is. And as I say, unless we go back a very long way, back prior to 0910, that figure is going to be 325,000. But when dealing with lifetime transfers, chargeable when made, then for the tax year in which it was made, you use the then nil rate band. And we know how to compute the IHT, knowing that if we go above that particular nil rate band, probably 325,000, then the excess is to be taxed. There was then a further question, what rate? And that was based, of course, on who pays the tax. If it was the donor that had decided to pay the tax on the transfer into the trust, then the tax rate on the excess above the nil rate band, well, that, of course, would be at 25%. If he had allocated the liability for the tax to be paid by the trustees of that trust, obviously taking the money out of the trust itself, then that would be a gross transfer, and then it would be 20%. And so we compute the gross amount of chargeable transfers. In one example that I showed you, we had, of course, two CLTs. And we made the point there that the seven-year cumulative period was applicable that if we now make our very first CLT, then if we make a further CLT within seven years of that first CLT, we work on the accumulation principle. Remember, as we said all along, IHT is a cumulative donor-based tax. So if at, uh, let's say, uh, June 2000 and uh, where should we go to? June 2016, there was a CLT. And then in June 2020, some four years later, there was another CLT. How would you deal with the chargeability to IHT on that second chargeable lifetime transfer? Well, that, of course, is based on 
what was the gross chargeable transfer for the first CLT. If that figure was, say, £400,000, and you make the next CLT some four years later, then the nil rate band has all been used. And that therefore means that you're going to have to pay tax at 40 per, sorry, at the lifetime rate, be that the net rate of 25 or the gross rate of 20%. If, of course, the earlier CLT was less than the nil rate band available within June 2020, so 20. Uh, 2021 tax year there, then the remaining available new rate band would be used. So the earlier CLT was, say, a gross figure of £300,000, and that leaves 25000 of the new rate band then available. Then the excess would be taxable, as we've said, at 25% if the donor pays the tax, at 20% if the trustees pay the tax. So we saw the seven-year accumulation period there. It meant that if a client was asking you about the timing of a subsequent, a, the next transfer into a trust that they had set up and made a transfer into some six and a half years ago, then depending on the amounts of transfer involved, we would very likely be advising our client, don't make the next transfer now, nor indeed within the next six months. If it is now six and a half years since that first CLT, that would be still be showing on the taxpayer's clock. And that would impact, therefore, on the taxability of the next CLT. Now, if we are already above, or the next CLT would take us above the nil rate band that remains, of course, then it would be advisable to wait for just over six months or six months wait until the old CLT has run its seven-year course and then it drops off the clock, thus opening up for the next seven years the further nil rate band availability, which again, given that it hasn't changed for so many years, is likely to still be, in your exam, will still be £325,000. So we saw the seven-year accumulation period applied to CLTs where you work on this seven-year rolling cycle in terms of chargeability on a subsequent uh, CLT based on what lies within the seven years prior to it in the way of earlier CLTs. We got firstly introduced to the seven-year concept, though, back in our very first lecture, where, as we've just said, we do not, of course, on the death of the taxpayer, merely end up being taxed on the content of the chargeable estate. What we firstly must charge to IHT is any and all lifetime transfers made within the seven years before the date of death. And that will include, of course, both pets that now become chargeable for the very first and only time. They are only chargeable on death, only if made within the seven years before the date of death. And we would also bring in any CLTs that were made within the seven years before the date of death. And we would compute, if any, the additional tax now to be paid in relation to that CLT. The chargeable amount being chargeable above the now nil rate band at the rate on death, 40%, having only previously applied the equivalent to a gross rate of 20%. So it is possible, but not always the case, that additional tax may be paid. We know, of course, that taper relief would have served to reduce any current charge on death, and that may be sufficient and then that when we take account and then deduct the lifetime tax paid on the CLT, that there's actually no additional tax to be paid. OK, what we have therefore not seen until now is what happens if we have CLTs that are made more than seven years before the date of death. So let's see what we say about this in our notes. So, if as we know pets have been made more than seven years before the date of death, then they were neither chargeable when made, nor now would they be chargeable on death. And that was illustration eight that we refer to just above in that first paragraph they will be exempt IHT. 
and they're ignored when looking at the seven year accumulation period. So any transfers that do fall within the seven years of the date of death and are chargeable as a result then of that subsequent death, their chargeability is unaffected by the fact that eight years before the date of death, there happened also to be a pet. It is exempt and it doesn't go into your accumulation exercise here in determining what, if any, new rate band would be available of those transfers falling within the seven years before the date of death and which therefore are taxable. It was ignored. That is the case for, P uh, for pets, but we're going to see that it is not the case for CLTs. So they, as we say, are exempt IHT and ignored when looking at the seven year accumulation period used to compute the IHT on transfers that do fall within the seven years of death and which are therefore chargeable. Now, as I suggested in the introduction to this, it's uh, an area that often, let's hope not in your case here, but often causes problems for students. So possibly, it's always a subjective opinion, the most difficult concept to grasp. But it can't be that difficult because it's not a very big note that we're now dealing with. It's the application of that that I'll show you in a couple of examples that is the key issue. What is it? It is how to deal with the CLT made more than seven years before the date of death. So if it's more than seven years before the date of death, it will not be taxable on death. There will be no additional tax to pay on it. It is not chargeable on death, though it was chargeable when made. It's not chargeable on death because it doesn't fall within the seven years before the date of death. So these transfers were chargeable when made, and when made, you would have used the nil rate band in force at that date in the tax year in which it was made. But they are not chargeable on death, as we've said, as the taxpayer has survived for the required seven years. So in that context, it's the same as we saw for a pet. A pet that was eight years before the date of death, a CLT that is eight years before the date of death is not taxable as a result of that death. But then we get the important difference. The seven year accumulation period, however, means that when computing the IHT on either a PET or a CLT, or indeed it could be both of those subsequent transfers, that when computing the tax payable on a PET or CLT that has indeed been made within the seven years of death, it is necessary to take account of any CLT made within the seven years prior to it, so as to determine how much nil rate band, if any, remains to use against that transfer. So whereas with a pet that was more than seven years before the date of death, it was entirely exempt. It was not chargeable on death, nor did it impact on those transfers, the ones within the seven years before death, that are taxable on death. The CLT, though itself not taxable, because as we keep saying, it is more than seven years before the date of death, it is going to impact on the availability of any nil rate band that fall within the seven years of the date of that CLT. Now that is best shown in an example. It's a potentially tricky concept to get into your head with all sorts of dates and issues flying around. So we're going to use an example here and we'll illustrate this example with some numbers. But first of all, what's the scenario? So an individual dies in January 2020. Now, when you see that the taxpayer has died, we know that we are going to most certainly have to compute the computation headed lifetime transfers chargeable on death and also deal with the chargeable estate. That is for sure. In relation to the lifetime transfers chargeable on death, we only go back seven years from the date of death. 
So whatever was the day in January 2020, we go back to that date in January 2013. And only transfers within that seven year period would now be taxable. What did we do in lifetime? We'd made a CLT in June 2010. What do you know about a CLT? That CLT was chargeable when made. And therefore, when made, you would have compared the then chargeable transfer with the then nil rate band. It happened at that date still to be £325,000. You'd have compared it and any excess above 325 tax at either 25% or 20%. Who paid the tax? Was it a net? Was it a gross transfer? So it would have been chargeable when made. But of course, it falls outside of the seven years before the date of death. So what we know is that it is not chargeable on death. There'd be no additional tax to pay. It is not chargeable on death. So as it says here, this CLT will not be taxable on the death of the taxpayer as he survived for more than seven years. But what we've been saying is that that CLT, unlike a pet, was chargeable when made. It went on to the IHT computation in that name, lifetime transfers chargeable when made. Whereas a pet was ignored in lifetime. It would only become chargeable, only become relevant to an IHT computation if you died within seven years of that. If you lived for more than seven years, it was entirely exempt. If, however, he had also made a pet in August 15. Now, if you made a pet in August 15, the date of death was January 20. That falls within seven years. We can clearly see that is after January 13 and therefore is within the seven years before the date of death. That pet will be taxable. So the pet will be taxable. But to know, as that is the first, and as we'll discover here, only lifetime transfer falling within the seven years before the date of death, you know that given the cumulative nature of this tax, you can never look at a single isolated transfer and attempt to compute the tax thereon. You need to know what has gone on in the seven years before the date of that transfer. This cumulative donor based tax, as we keep on referring to it as. So back to the note. In computing the nil rate band available to go against the PET, now on death January 20, 1920 tax year, 325 is our nil rate band, assuming we've got no other transferred, a transfer of an unused nil rate band, then that 325,000 nil rate band will be reduced by the amount of the June 2010 CLT. Why? Because June 2010 is within seven years of August 15. When you put that June 2010 CLT, that transfer into the trust, you knew that if you made another transfer within the next seven year period, that that CLT was already on the taxpayer's clock. Now, that originally was just a further CLT, as we again have just discussed. So it would have impacted on lifetime transfers chargeable when made. But now it also impacts in this computation, lifetime transfers chargeable on death. Because June 2010 is within seven years of August 15. And therefore, whatever was the gross chargeable transfer of the CLT in June 2010, that figure will be deemed to have used that amount of the 325,000 nil rate band. Now that figure, of course, was itself more than 325. It would mean that that pet would become fully chargeable. 
But even if it wasn't more than 325, whatever it was, I will give you some numbers in a moment's time, that that amount of the neural rate band would be deemed to have used, been already used, and the PET would only have available what remains. So, the 325,000 neural rate band will be reduced, reduced by the amount of the June 2010 CLT as it had been made within the seven years prior to the PET. So even though the June 2010 transfer, this CLT, is not itself taxable on the death of the taxpayer, it may still impact and it will impact on those transfers that are taxable on death. These lifetime transfers chargeable on death that are within the seven years of the date of death, thus making them chargeable, but they also fall within seven years of an earlier CLT. The June 2010 CLT will cease to impact on the use of the nil rate band and thus the taxability of these lifetime transfers. Remember, the accumulation principle only works, only applies to a seven year period. So the CLT was made in June 2010. It ceases to have effect after June 17. Now let's therefore take that concept and put numbers in and see how we would deal with the computations that then apply. So if you make a note now of uh, these figures, I'm telling you that, as you can see in front of you here, that the June 2010 CLT was a gross chargeable transfer of £200,000. That is the gross chargeable transfer. In August 15, the chargeable transfer of the PET was £300,000. So these are not transfers of values, they are chargeable transfer figures. I've referred to the CLT figure of 200 as being a gross chargeable transfer. Now that, of course, would be a bit of a moot point because if it was the first and only CLT made to that date, then 200, this was back in June 10, the 1011 tax year, we still then had a 325,000 nil rate band. So at that point, all of that 200,000 would be within the nil rate band and there'd be no lifetime tax to have paid. But what has now happened, August 15, we have a pet. Let's now assume that that pet is £300,000. And on January 20, in January 20, when the taxpayer died, that the death estate amounted to £500,000. The first computation to have been prepared, of course, would have been that of chargeable transfers. We know those figures. We would then have done lifetime transfers chargeable when made. That was the CLT, but because the figure was itself then within the then available nil rate band, there was no tax to pay. And so we come to lifetime transfers chargeable on death. The date of death, January 20. As we already know, we go back seven years from that date, back to January 13 then come forward from that date, looking for the first lifetime transfer falling within the seven years from the date of death. That amount was the August 15 pet there of £300,000. Now you'll notice here that I've left a bit of a gap from these normal columnar headings of gross and IHT before putting that figure in. You'll see why in a moment. And you'll see the impact of that June 2010 CLT. If that June 2010 CLT did not exist, there were no CLTs in the seven years before this date, August 15, then that PET would have now all of the available nil rate band at the date of death, again, £325,000 available. And therefore, there would be no IHT to pay. That would have been the case. But it isn't the case. Because there was, and we'll now record this here on our computation, we had as a brought forward figure here at the uh, beginning of this period, 
we had the brought forward CLT and we will record any and all CLTs that fell within the seven years prior to this transfer, prior to this PET. So that's within the seven years of what was the date of the PET? August 15. So we would have gone back all the way to, well, seven years back from August 15 would take us to August 2008. So any transfers from August 2008 that were CLTs, that those figures would have been shown here. Now, what figure did we have as the June 2010 CLT? It was £200,000. Now, whether that figure was 200000 or, as we'll show you in a separate example in a moment's time, a figure greater than £325,000, i.e. the new rate ban that exists at the date of death here, there would be no IHT in relation to it, arising now on death. This computation is lifetime transfers chargeable on death. It being more than seven years before death is not chargeable on death. So whatever that number was, 200,000 or a bigger a figure than the available nil rate band, doesn't matter. There is no IHT now chargeable on death. The relevance of it is that because it exists, that 300,000 now takes us up to 500,000. It means that instead of that pet enjoying all of the 325 nil rate band, we'll only now have available, given that we're deeming 200,000 of it to be, have already, to have been already used, it means that only 125,000 would be at the nil rate, leaving 175,000 now to be taxed at 40%. So what you can see that this earlier CLT has done is to push £175,000 of that PET out of the nil rate band that otherwise would have been available and up into the 40% band. Now, of course, there we do that calculation. 40% uh, of 4 times 17,500 is, I think, 70,000. But please do check that. It's the principle, however, that's important here, not just my maths. But of course, August 15, by comparison to a date of death of January 20, that is more than three years prior to the death of the taxpayer. Therefore, any tax charge now arising would, of course, be available for taper relief. And all you do is, as we've always done, just count forward from the date of the pet, August 15, through to the date of death, January 20, to see how many years we have. August 15 would go August 16, 17, 18, 19. We don't get through to August 20, so we've survived for between four to five years. And you then would apply the taper relief for between four to five years, i.e. some 40%. That would be deducted, as we've shown many times before, and you would get the amount of tax due then on that pet. And as it's on a pet, the amount of tax would be payable, of course, by the individual beneficiary, the donee of that specific lifetime gift. But to go back to the note, you can see here that the only lifetime transfer that we have had within the seven years before the date of death is that PET itself there in August 15. So our lifetime transfers chargeable on death computation is now complete. Once we'd taken away the taper relief, that was the only figure of tax payable in relation to a lifetime transfer as a result of the death of the taxpayer. So then you'd come to deal with the chargeable estate. Now, of course, as you know, in taxing that chargeable estate, 
an amount of £500,000 there, we need to know at the date of death what available nil rate band still exists. And that is based on what happened in the seven years before the date of death. As I said to you, that these CLTs only impact on transfers that are made within the next seven years of them. So that date was August uh, 15. Oh, sorry, uh, the date of the uh, CLT, I beg your pardon, that was back in, when was it? June 10. That earlier CLT that fell within the seven years of August 15 was back in June 10. June 10 was within the seven years of August 15, the date of the pet. But what happens is seven years after it came onto the clock, it is then removed from the clock. So what does that mean? It means that June 10, remember, was the date of the CLT. So in June 17, some seven years later, we remove the amount of that CLT. That was 200,000. So that CLT, it's run its seven year course, is removed. That was 200,000. And that, of course, means that as at the date of death, within the seven years before the date of death, there is only the one chargeable transfer, and that's the pet of 300,000. That is the balance on the taxpayer's clock of lifetime transfers made within the seven years before the date of death. So what would that mean when it comes then to taxing your chargeable estate. You know that the chargeable estate is five. Oh, what's going on here? Doesn't seem to want to write there. The chargeable estate, that's writing again, 500,000 pounds. We know that the seven years before the date of death, we have a total of 300,000. We have a nil rate band of 325. Therefore, the taxability of that chargeable estate would be 25,000 at nil, the remainder of the nil rate band, and that would still leave 475,000 to be taxed at 40%. And whatever that figure comes out to, that would be the IHT on the chargeable estate. Okay, now take a moment to go back through this note and the example that we have done. Before then, we'll move on to look at the last remaining example here within this particular section, and indeed within the chapter on IHT. But review through before we go into that uh, uh, problem example two. Okay, if we're now set and ready to tackle example two, let's see what we've got to do. Uh, two requirements. Calculate the IHT payable on the lifetime gifts when they were made, assuming that D paid any lifetime tax due. Now, we know that the only lifetime gifts that are chargeable when made are CLTs. And we now know that if D paid any lifetime tax due, that they would be net transfers. Also, to calculate the IHT payable as a result of D's debt, that, of course, we know requires two computations, lifetime transfers chargeable on death. That will include both PETs and CLTs, if any, falling within the seven years of the date of death. And it will also be the chargeable estate at death. As we can see here, what they've also done, as any exam question would do, is to supply us with nil rate bans applicable prior to the 1920 tax year. As we've said, from 0910, it has always been 325. But they also give us the figure for 0809 there at 312,000 pounds. Let's see whether and how that may be relevant to us. So we start now to read the question. Deceased, humorously entitled, 
uh, died on the 1st of March 21. So 1st of March 21, what lifetime transfers will become chargeable as a result of the death of the taxpayer? We go back seven years, that therefore will take us back to the 1st of March 2014. On death, died leaving a chargeable estate of £500,000, having made the following lifetime gifts. Right, the first one that we've got, cash to son. Cash to son, that is a pet. What is the date of that pet? 1st of October 2008. What does that therefore mean? It means that there was no chargeability when it was made and there will be no chargeability on death because we've survived, or here D survived, for more than seven years following the date of that transfer. So it will not feature on any of the IHT computations. It is not chargeable when made because it's a PET, not a CLT. It is not chargeable on death because it wasn't made within the seven years of the date of death. But something about it is still going to be relevant here and hence its inclusion within the question. Because the next transfer is cash into a trust. That is a CLT. That therefore was chargeable when made. When was it made? 1st of June 09. To compute the chargeable transfer, from what you're given here, the amount of cash, that is the transfer of value, as was the £100,000 cash to the son, that was the transfer of value there, we need to work out a chargeable transfer figure. And a chargeable transfer figure is, of course, after deducting their, those lifetime exemptions. And in relation to the PET, it occurred in... October 08, that was 0809, and even though it was not chargeable when made, and it is not then chargeable on death, it would still be you deemed to have used that year's annual exemption for 0809. Why is that relevant to us here? Because the 1st of June 09 CLT, which is chargeable when made, and we do have to compute the IHT payable on the lifetime gifts when they were made, that June 09 is in 0910. Now, as you know, when you deal with the deduction of annual exemptions from the transfer of value, you would deduct the current year's annual exemption first. That would be 0910 in relation to the CLT. And then, if unused, the unused annual exemption from the previous year. As we can see there, the previous year, we had the pet that would be deemed to have utilised the annual exemption. Not, of course, just of that year, but of the previous year. But that doesn't matter because it's never going to be taxable. But even though not taxable when made, not taxable on death, you still apply the annual exemption of that year to it. So you'll only have one CLT, so you'll only have one annual exemption to go against the CLT in computing the chargeable transfer. 1st of September 15, cash to daughter. That is a pet. Again, that 296 is the transfer of value. So again, you know we have to deduct lifetime exemptions. I'll leave you to figure based on that date there what exemptions they are that are able there to be deducted. It is an important calculation, of course, because this time, the 1st of September 15, that's after the 1st of March 14, it is therefore within the seven years of the date of death and will become chargeable. Very clearly, of course, September 15 is more than three years from the date of death and therefore, though it is chargeable, any tax charge that arises is, of course, then going to be eligible for taper relief to reduce that tax charge. But given what we've just said, we should now recognise another issue. That when we come to do the computation of lifetime transfers chargeable on death, 
then as we have seen, the only transfer within the seven years before the date of death is that one. So it is only the pet that becomes chargeable on death. All the other transfers are well before the seven years from the date of death. The pet was not chargeable when made, was not chargeable on death, doesn't affect any of the IHT computations. But the June 09 cash into trust, that CLT, though more than seven years from date of death and is not taxable, it is within the seven years of that subsequent pet that does become chargeable on death. So when it comes to taxing that chargeable transfer, whatever that amount is on that pet for September 15, we know that we have to reduce any available nil rate band by however much of it has already been deemed to be used against the June 09 CLT. But step by step, first step, of course, to compute the chargeable transfers. You know the transfers of value. I've made reference to any deductions, exemptions available. Can you now pause at this point and go compute the chargeable transfer? You will then recognise that, of course, we know that we have a CLT. You'll have at that point the chargeable transfer based on the transfer of value of 336, but reduced by any exemptions available. You should already know the answer to that. So that, therefore, as you can see, would still leave you with a figure in excess of the then nil rate band. Uh, that, again, that was in 0910. So that, therefore, was 325,000. And that, therefore, was bigger than that. And therefore, there would be chargeability. You know what rate there would be because D has paid any lifetime tax due in relation to those lifetime transfers. That What was due in lifetime, that is. She's paid it. So I'd like you to do those first two exercises. Compute the chargeable transfers, transfer of value. Remember across your page from earliest to latest, the transfers of value. And those, of course, will be recorded as PET, CLT, PET, with the respective dates. Transfer of value, less exemptions, chargeable transfer. Is there a CLT? Yes. Head up lifetime transfers, chargeable when made. Again, if you cannot do that computation, you go back to your earlier notes and you make sure that you revise that and you do that. You don't just wait for me to take you through it. You need to be able to do that now. And you work, therefore, what would be the gross chargeable transfer on that June 09 CLT. Do that for me now, then we'll catch up, then we'll move on, of course, to look at what happens on death. OK, let's look at what we have here. Uh, again, hopefully you've read through that already. And that's just a summary of our analysis of the lifetime transfers in terms of what's a PET, what's a CLT, and what, if anything, is chargeable. Step one, then, having made that analysis, was to compute the chargeable transfer figures. Now, again, we've got uh, two lifetime transfers here. We've got the CLT in June 09. Notice, again, here, we are talking about the uh, chargeable transfers. Um, there was the earlier PET, you could put a, a column in for it if you wish, but you know there's going to be no chargeable transfer. The relevance of it is dealt in, with here in a note. But that transfer of value of the CLT was £336,000. The September 15 PET, 296 straight from the question. What exemptions are available? The June 09 CLT gets only the annual exemption of the current year. Why? Because the 0809 annual exemption has already been applied to that 1st of October 8 PET, despite it never becoming chargeable. Now again, given that there's no marks for workings here in terms of an exam question, you're just going to do this as quickly and as easily as you can. However, don't cut corners. 
make sure you deal with it step by step, based, of course, on whatever the requirements of the questions are on probably your section B, as this question as this would be, though a little cross section of this could be a section A question. Like just computing the lifetime transfers chargeable when made and any IHT that was payable in lifetime. So we deduct our relevant annual exemptions, only 0910 in relation to the CLT, leaving us with a chargeable transfer of 333. The September 15 PET, of course, benefits not only from the annual exemption of that year, 1516, but because it is also unused, that of the previous year, 1415. And that brings us down to a chargeable transfer of 290. Do we have any CLTs? Yes, we have a ECLT, and hence this computation is required. Lifetime transfers chargeable when made. It was June 09, it was a CLT, the chargeable transfer, 333,000 included there. What then, back in 0910, was the nil rate band, it was 325. We've gone above that at 333, so 325 is at nil. That leaves a balancing figure of 8,000 out of the 333 that is now above the nil rate band and is to be taxed in lifetime. As the donor, D, paid the IHT, the transfer, as we've already agreed in our analysis of the information in the question, is a net transfer and therefore we use the net rate taxing the excess above the nil rate band at 25%. 25% of 8,000 is of course 2,000 pounds. Put that into your tax column. Now because that 333 is a net figure, to get this one, the gross transfers, we must simply add the tax figure to the net transfer to give you a gross of 335. Job done. Having dealt with that task, it's now, of course, time to deal with the lifetime transfers that are chargeable as a result of the death of the taxpayer. So we would set up our computation, lifetime transfers chargeable on death. I won't show too much of this in here. Oops. Hopefully you can see all of this on your screen, but you can see it in front of you as well. Lifetime transfers are chargeable on death. Again, a subjective statement, the hardest part, as it were, there. Hopefully, not too hard. Uh, requires us to firstly determine the earliest transfer within the seven years before death, as we've always done. State the date of death, go back seven years. That's the starting point. In this example, there's only one such transfer, the PET in September 15. But of course, in computing any IHT payable on that transfer, we must take account of what nil rate band is available. After firstly deducting from that nil rate band any CLTs, only CLTs, made within the seven years, try not to cross it out, within the seven years of this transfer. So, You'd set up leaving space at the top of this working that the lifetime transfer that is chargeable on death is indeed that PET dated September 15. But before you proceed to tax what was a chargeable transfer figure of £290,000, we must recognise that within the seven years before it, we've got gross chargeable transfers of 335. And as 335 is less than, sorry, 335 is less than, as 335 is more than the 325,000 nil rate band that existed at the date of death, it is now the nil rate band at the date of death that we use here, then that is, of course, going to use up all of your nil rate band and it will therefore push the pet fully into the 40% band. So we set up our computation as normal, headed lifetime transfers chargeable on death. I'd usually state the date of death there, but of course, this isn't a written exam. It's not likely to feature within section C. It's an objective testing question. 
So you're not even going to head that up in your own workings. You're simply going to know that this is what you are doing. Growth transfers IHT. The first and only transfer within the seven years before death is that one. The CLT, sorry, the PET, I beg your pardon, dated the 1st of September 15. Go back seven years prior to September 15. That'll take you back to what, September 08, and only include there CLTs within the seven years before the 1st of September 15. That, as we know, is the 335. Remember whether that number is now bigger than the nil rate band on death, the self same 325 or not, is irrelevant because there's no tax. Again, here in this IHT column, there is no tax going in there. It is not taxable on death. The damage is done, however, because it now pushes all of that 290 out of what would otherwise have been an available nil rate band of 325 and up into the 40% bracket. That, therefore, is £116,000. Do check my numbers there, of course. Hopefully that's right. £116,000 worth of IHT chargeable on the PET. However, given the distance from the date of the PET to the death of the taxpayer, it, though less than seven years, is more than three years, we have available a deduction for taper relief. Again, hopefully I've done the correct calculations there, but check it through for yourself, that that date of PET, September 15, is between five to six years from the date of death. That therefore creates a 60% taper relief. Again, check the numbers, deduct it to give you, therefore, the amount of tax chargeable in relation to that PET as a result of the death of the taxpayer. Now then, that would have sorted out the lifetime transfers chargeable on debt. Indeed, it was the lifetime transfer chargeable on debt. But it still meant that we would have to, of course, deal with the death estate. Now, back in September 15, you'd added the 290. And at that date, your cumulative total on this taxpayer's clock this accumulated, uh, accumulated clock figure here, would be 600,000. If that was the situation at the date of death, then, of course, there'd be no nil rate ban to go against the death estate. But that, of course, is not the case. Because that earlier CLT was dated, if we go back here, there we go, June 09. It was only going to impact on subsequent transfers made within seven years of June 09. That, therefore, would mean add seven to 09. That would only go through to June 16. That impacted on the PET, as we have seen, but anything after June 16. So if there had been another PET that arose after June 16 and before the date of death, on this computation here, we would have got to, as that was, remember, uh, June of 2009, we'd have got to, let me just check, it was June 2009, can't remember, yeah, 1st of June 2009. So when you got to the 1st of June 2016, that earlier CLT would have been removed. How much was it? It was 335,000. You take away your 335,000 and that of course would therefore bring you down to, what would that be, uh, 265? Or something like that? Yeah, 265,000 pounds. And that therefore would open up more Available. No, that can't be right. 335, 290. Ah, now I see there. 335 and 290 is not 600. I always tell you to check my calculations. So that figure there would have been, let's get rid of that, that would have been £625,000. Take away 335, 
that's 290. It had to be that 290 because other than the 335, it's the only transfer made within the seven years of the date of death. <coughs> so that means that at the date of death, what chargeable transfers within the previous seven years, 290, the nil rate band available at that point, 325, and that therefore means when we look at the chargeable estate at death, nil rate band 325 minus 290 equals 35,000 pounds. That 35,000 is at nil, 465,000 therefore remains to be taxed at 40%. That's 186, and that is the tax arising on death. That is therefore explained in terms of that note, what we've done. Apologies for the additions error there, but hopefully no damage done and we're clear now. It's a tricky concept for many. It does demand that you go back and work through this and try therefore to get this issue resolved sooner rather than later. Obviously then in terms of whichever revision or exam kit you are using, practice these techniques please. That therefore finishes off the uh, only other technical issue that we had to look at in terms of IHT and that therefore leaves the final lecture for you on IHT planning, which I introduced to you at the beginning of this lecture. Again, check that out, please, before next time.